All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, we are going to be picking up in Second Corinthians chapter 11 today, as Doug finished out uh, chapter 10 last week. So if you want to turn there, or you can look on the paper, that, uh, the handout, if you don't have one, there's some more up here. But uh, we're going to begin reading in uh, chapter 11, verse 1, and today we're going to read through verse 6. So Paul says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together to study your word. I just pray that I would be faithful in teaching it, and Father, that you would uh, guide and direct our thoughts and actions and uh, knowledge this morning towards you. May all that we do here this morning glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this morning, uh, we're really going to get to the heart of 2 Corinthians. We're really going to get to where Paul was going in these first 11 chapters, the whole reason he wrote the book, if you will. Um, 2 Corinthians isn't like a lot of uh, Paul's other epistles in that it's not deep theologically. It's not adding doctrine, but it's on a topic that is extremely important, um, and that is the topic of loyalty. The whole reason that Paul wrote the book of 2 Corinthians is because of loyalty. Um, and loyalty is of great concern to God. We do have to ask, though, what does loyalty to God look like? What does it mean to be loyal to God? Um, in Matthew 27, um, 22, 37, Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He named that as the greatest command, and that is what loyalty to God looks like, is loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And loyalty to God is indeed a key part of the Christian walk. Just like loyalty in marriage is a key part of a marriage. Loyalty to friendship is a key part of a friendship. You can't have a relationship without loyalty. And any kind of relationship requires loyalty, and much more so our relationship with God. This loyalty, though, works itself into human hearts so easily. Um, If you would like to see this, all you have to do is look through the Old Testament. Look at Israel, the examples of how easily it was for them to be led astray from their loyalty to God. Um, any time that the Israelites began to take in the culture around them, any time that they began to uh, look to man rather than to God or to put away God's word, immediately they would just go astray. Uh, think of Mount Sinai, how quickly they turned away from God and they built that graven image. Uh, think of Solomon, the wisest of all men, how easily he was led astray by these women. And things don't really change when we get in the New Testament, do they? Look at Judas, he led astray for money. Um, Look at all the churches, as Paul's writing these epistles, that were so easily led astray. And today, things are the exact same. We see the same thing. People are so easily led astray. They become disloyal. And so the Corinthian church had become disloyal to Paul and the true gospel. They had been led astray by these false apostles who were turning the church at Corinth away from Paul. But ultimately, they were turning turning them away from their loyalty to God and the true gospel. Uh, Paul had spent 20 plus months with the Corinths, with them, teaching them the true doctrine of, and the, the true gospel. But um, instead of just continuing in that, they turn away. And this breaks Paul's heart. Um, not because it's his name that they're against, not because they've become disloyal to Paul, but because they've become disloyal to God. And so Paul is more concerned about the message that he has brought to them, the gospel, the true gospel. He's worried about their loyalty to this than they are, than he is to himself. Um, And this is what we saw last week. Uh, Paul is basically being forced here to defend himself. Um, It's something he doesn't like doing. It's something he's not comfortable doing. Where the false apostles are are very comfortable in bragging on themselves and commending themselves, this is not something that Paul enjoys doing at all. 
He prefers to boast in Christ, not in himself. As Doug mentioned last week, um, false teachers are those who have a sense of pride. They usually are those who will boast in themselves, commend themselves. But a true teacher of Christ doesn't boast in himself. They boast in their humility. They boast in the work that Christ has done in their life, not what they have done. Uh, if you'll look back at verses 12 and 13 of 2 Corinthians 10, Paul says, Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Verse 13, But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. And then in a few verses later, in verse 16, he says, Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. We see from those verses that Paul did not want to compare himself with these false apostles. He didn't want to get into a debate over who was better or even who was more qualified. He did not want to boast in himself at all because he had no reason to boast. He knew that his ministry was given to him by God. The work in his life, his knowledge, all of it was by the grace of God. And so self-commendation uh, is meaningless. And we're told in Proverbs 27 too, that we should let another praise you and not your own mouth. Paul was never one to commend himself, but he always takes the route of depreciating himself. He refers to himself as the Corinthians uh, servant, and he called himself a clay pot. He boasted about his weakness. In uh, Timothy, he calls himself the chief of sinners. Romans 7, he calls himself a wretched man. He refers, to, uh, so we get this, get to our passage this morning, and we see Paul starting to defend himself, and he begins um, in, a, in a way that shows just how much he doesn't enjoy it. Um, he's, again, he's doing this because there's more at stake here than a reputation. There's more at stake there than his name. What's at stake is the Corinthians' loyalty. The false apostles were not just trying to attack Paul for the sake of destroying his name. They were attacking him so that they could lead the Corinths away to their false teaching, their false beliefs. So on this occasion, Paul had to engage in foolishness. He isn't boasting for the sake of his own ego, but for the sake of the gospel. Starting today in 11.1 uh, and really going all the way to 12.13, we're, we see what some commentators refer to as the fool's speech. And he does this because the Corinthians' loyalty is at stake. Their devotion, their allegiance, their wholeheartedness to Christ is at stake. And it was for the sake of the Corinthians that Paul is doing this, not for himself. If you look down at uh, 2 Corinthians 12.19, he says, have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. And so this, this speech that is given, this foolish speech, is for the building up of the church at Corinth. And so these first six verses that we're going to look at this morning um, are, are basically boiled down to four bullet points. Paul's going to be discussing the Corinthians' loyalty to God, their loyalty to Christ, their loyalty to the gospel, and their loyalty to the truth. And uh, in the Greek, each of these is introduced with the word gar, which means for. He's making a bullet point of why he's being foolish. I'm being foolish for this reason, for this reason. And you can really follow it pretty easily. Um, so let's look back at verse 1 and begin looking at this text this morning. It says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. Paul is saying, would you, would you please just follow along with me? He knows it's foolish what he's about to do. He knows that he's being a fool, commending himself, uh, um, standing up for himself. But he's acknowledging here, you've listened through 1 Corinthians. You've listened through the severe little letter. You've turned back from these false apostles. Do just bear with me. Just walk along with me a little further here. They had repented for much of their foolishness, um, and they had returned to Paul's teaching but Paul wanted to ensure that there wasn't any disloyalty remaining within that body. He wanted to ensure that all ties to these false apostles had been cut and they had a pure devotion to God again. And so he continues in verse 2 with his, this first bullet point. Um, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. Now how can Paul attest here that he is jealous for the Corinthians when in Galatians he says jealousy is a fruit of the flesh, not of the spirit? Well, is jealousy wrong? In a worldly sense, yes, jealousy is wrong. We, we're not to covet. We're not to uh, 
uh, be jealous of one another, which leads to quarrels. But there's a sense that divine jealousy is perfectly right. We're told that, that God is a jealous God. In uh, Exodus 25, it says, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Everything in all of creation was created for the glory of God. So a divine jealousy is perfectly right. Paul is saying he's being foolish because he's worried about their commitment to God. He isn't worried about their commitment to him, but their relationship with God is at stake. Paul had had this zeal for the honor of God. Um, It's like in Psalm 69 where the psalmist says, For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Paul was concerned with the church's loyalty because the churches he planted bore witness about God. Um, a few verses, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 11, 28 to 29 says, And apart from these things, there's this daily pressure on me of the anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. This anxiety here that Paul's referring to is, is not because he's worried about the church growing. He's not worried about the church's building fund. He's worried what, in what the church is presenting as who God is. As, their, as his people, we bear a witness about who God is. And so Paul had this anxiety because he saw these churches that he had planted falling away. If you want to, in your free time, read Second Timothy 4, it's just he's constantly listing all these people and churches who had fallen away from the truth of the gospel. And so we, we know that the things which angered God angered Paul. And likewise, should they not anger us? If we see a church that's following false doctrine or a person who was once a professing Christian appearing to fall away from the faith, that should anger us and it should hurt us. And it should, because we should have a zeal for the honor and glory of God. Um, and so... The second issue brought up in verse 2 says, Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Now the word since here is the same word that gar for. uh, The ESV decided to translate it since, but again, this is the second bullet point. And the the point that he's wanting to make to the Corinthians is uh, to bear with him in his foolishness because he's concerned with their loyalty to Christ. Um, he gives us an analogy here of a virgin being betrothed to one husband. Now, the betrothal process was a little different than what we have today. Usually today we see people date for a little while, they get engaged, then they get married. The betrothal process, though, was, was uh, a lot different in the sense that the person would be betrothed, the uh, husband and wife would be betrothed together, And the husband would go away. He would go away for about a year usually, preparing a place for the bride and him to come together. Um, This may be adding on to his father's house or building his own place, whatever it may be. And during this time, it was the bride's responsibility to remain faithful, to remain pure, to remain wholehearted to her soon-to-be husband. Uh, She would be fulfilling those marriage vows, the betrothal vows, prior to the actual ceremony. But the difference between engagement and betrothal was this was a legally binding contract. Um, If the wife was found to be defiled during this time or unpure, undevoted, the husband had the right to either divorce her or to have her killed. If you'll remember back to the story of uh, Joseph and Mary, whenever Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, he was going to divorce her quietly, we're told, as to not bring shame upon her. He had that option to divorce her, even though they technically weren't married yet. They were betrothed. It was a legally binding vow. And so it, it's not only the bride's responsibility, though, to remain pure. There was some weight that fell on her father. Her father was supposed to watch her during this year, during this betrothal process. He was supposed to keep a lookout for her to make sure that she remained pure, to uh, ensure that she remained undefiled. And so we see some remnants of that today where the father walks the bride down the aisle and hands her to the husband. It's, it's kind of the same thing where he's saying, here is my daughter. Um, in the same way, Paul says here, I'm like that father figure to you, church. The church we know is the bride of Christ, Christ being the groom. Um, Paul is saying, I'm like that father figure. I'm watching out for you. I want to make sure that you remain pure to Christ. Um, And so, because the marriage ceremony hasn't taken place yet, we have not been called up to be with Christ. 
it's up to him to make sure that they remain pure and devoted. Um, in John 14, we see Jesus say in 1 through 3, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. We see here he's taken on that responsibility as a groom. He's going to come back and get us. He's going to a place to prepare a place for us. And so Paul knew that it was his responsibility as, as an apostle to watch over and care for the church in Corinth. But today we don't have apostles walking around. So who is responsible for us? Well, we do have the writings, correct? We do have the writings to look back, the Word of God. But in Hebrews 10, uh, 22 through 25, we're told, Let us draw near with a true heart and fuel, full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast at the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, we, we do have a responsibility to one another now. We have a responsibility to point each other back to the word of God. Now, God has graciously given us elders and pastors to shepherd us, but as an individual, we also have a responsibility with those around us to say, hey, I think this area here may be drawing your loyalty away from Christ. Have you considered this verse? Have you considered this text? And likewise, if somebody comes up to us and says that, we should accept that. We should examine ourselves and see, does this person really see something that maybe I don't see? Because we, like I said, are so apt to become disloyal, to be pulled away from the truth of God's word. So verse 3 says, But I am afraid, as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and devotion, uh, and pure devotion to Christ. Uh, again, Paul is writing this letter to the church that he fears is being seduced. And there was this fear that the uh, church at Corinth had, had lost their loyalty to Christ, and Paul wants to use an analogy, and there's no clearer analogy to Paul than Eve. Uh, Paul had experienced the power of these seducers uh, in his missionary journeys. He knew all too well that they could lead people away from their affection for Christ. And again, that's still very present today. All through history, we see people who appeared to have a uh, pure devotion to Christ appearing to fall away. And so we have to ask that question, does that mean that people can lose their salvation? Well, when we turn to, to Scripture, it's very clear. Uh, 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they were not of us. So those who go out from us were not actually of us. That text is, is very plain and clear. But it's always good to be aware that People can be led astray. They can be pulled away from the truth. Not that people can be snatched out of the hand of God, but it helps us to know we've got to maintain our loyalty and steadfastness to Christ. And so, in Paul's mind, again, there's, there's not a clearer example in Scripture than, than Eve being deceived by the serpent. Uh, what he's referring to here is the incident that occurred in Genesis chapter 3, um, verses 1 through 7. And I put that text there. I think it's beneficial that we read it because he's referring to it here. <clears throat> it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. We know from scripture that the, the, the serpent there is actually Satan. 
Uh, we know that because in Revelation 12, 9, it says, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And so that, that serpent was Satan. Uh, he deceived Eve, and he made her think that she had been receiving the wrong information from God, right? Uh, the serpent presents Eve with this deception that truth is error, and that error is truth. And it's the same way that false teachers have functioned throughout history and still to this day. They take the truth and they turn it into a lie, and then they pre uh, present the lie as truth. And so in the account of Genesis 3, we see Satan takes up residence in this serpent, and uh, he, he speaks through the serpent. He finds Eve alone, without her headship, without Adam, and in the typical fashion, he performs this model-seducing technique. Uh, he says, has God really said to you that you shouldn't eat of something in this perfect garden that God has made? Uh, you, you've got to be mistaken. Something has to be wrong with the way you're thinking. What you've heard obviously can't be right. Why would God say that? And so he begins to make her question what God said. Now, if we look back at uh, Genesis 2, 16 and 18, we see that the command was not actually given to Eve. It was given to her husband, Adam. Uh, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in this day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then that next verse says that God saw that it uh, wasn't good for man to be alone, so he created Eve. Uh, so it, you can make the assumption here, maybe God spoke to Eve at a separate time, or maybe this was given to him uh, given to her by Adam. Maybe Adam told her, God said this, and apparently added on, you should not even touch it. God never said to Adam, you shouldn't touch it. He just said, don't eat of it. So maybe Adam added that in, or maybe God added that in later uh, to Eve. And so uh, if we think about this scenario for a moment, Adam and Eve, they, they really had no idea what death meant, did they? Death was not something that existed prior to the fall. And so Satan uses this technique where he says, uh, let me give you the real truth here. God is actually keeping something good from you. Satan wants Eve to know, uh, wants Eve, and he knows that if he can get her to desire to become like God, she'll be thrown out of the garden. He knows that from firsthand experience, right? Because that's why he was thrown out. He desired to be like God. So Eve hears this message and thinks, well, I would love to be more like God. Um, God is perfect. God is uh, mighty. Maybe there was some sin involved in that that I want to be more like God, but it could also have been I just want to be more like God. And that's, uh, and we, we see that today. People want to be more like God. That's why the Mormons are so successful. You want your own planet? You want to be your own God? Just follow these steps and you'll get there. Um, we, we see the Jehovah's Witness. We see the traditions of the church. All these things that are supposed to be more than Scripture. They take scripture and add a little bit more because we, we need a little bit more, right? False religions always try to present you with, with something new, something that they say you're missing. And if you only know this, then you can be more like God. You can be more enlightened. Um, if you only had this little extra bit of, of, of truth here, you would be able to understand everything better. And so it, it's the same scenario that we see with people who have been married 40, 50, and by God's grace, even longer. They want to have that newness again, that new feeling, and it leads them to commit adultery. In the same way with God, we, we say, well, I, I, I want that new feeling, like when I was first saved. But there's a lot of danger to that. Um, Charles Spurgeon put it in a, in a sermon I quoted there that you can read. We ought not as men in Christ Jesus to be carried away by a childish love of novelty. For we worship a God who is ever the same and whose years there is no end. In some matters, the old is better. There are certain things which are already so truly new that to change them for anything else would be to lose old gold for new dross. The old, old gospel is the newest thing in the world. In its very essence, it is forever good news. Like the Corinthian church, many today are not able to discern between truth and error. Many would argue that theology only puffs up, that knowledge only puffs up. We, we um, hear that a lot if you get in the charismatic movement. But the truth is that theology is wisdom. And 
Wisdom about God helps us discern between truth and error, where truth leads us closer to God and error leads us further away. So there, there is this, we need to study the old, old truths of Scripture because we need to know them very, very well. We don't need new. We need to go back to the old, well-trodden gospel. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Doug just went over that a few weeks ago, and it's so important to know that that battleground, the weapons against evil spirits, is not running around chanting in the name of Jesus, I cast you out. The, the power to fight the enemy is in knowledge of the truth. And so the, the battleground of war with the enemy is, is what we know to be truth. And just like Eve, she knew what God said was true, but she accepted the lie as truth. And that's where the sin took place. That's where the error took place. All right, so now on to the third point on why uh, Paul is concerned about their loyalty. In verse 4 it says, For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus... Uh, than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. This brings us again to our, our uh, third four. And this th third point here, here is Paul is worried about the Corinthians' loyalty to the gospel. In this verse, uh, Paul is referring to those false apostles who came, came proclaiming another Jesus. It isn't that they were proclaiming somebody besides Jesus. They were proclaiming the name of Jesus, but not the true gospel. It, it's, again, like so many false religions today, we'll see people proclaim the name of Jesus. The Catholics will say they worship, worship Jesus. The Mormons will say, we worship Jesus. Um, Jehovah's Witness, the same thing. And even Mormons will say that they believe in Jesus. But you boil it down to who is Jesus and that's where the error comes out. Um, the, theo the theology, the teaching of these false apostles is never directly mentioned um, in 2 Corinthians. But we do know that they were, were preaching a different gospel because of this verse here. Uh, uh, and from that we can glean that they were truly false apostles. Now Paul goes on to say in verse 4, Or if you receive a different spirit. Meaning that you receive something separate from the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are other spirits at work in the world. We, we, again, just talked about that verse where we have to fight off those spirits by knowledge of the truth. In Ephesians 6, Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are different spirits that aim to lead us away, and they want to deceive us. And... We know that the Holy Spirit only comes through the preaching and teaching of the true gospel. And so these false spirits would have been following these false apostles with their teaching and preaching of a different gospel. And so, again, how do we protect ourselves from these false spirits? We do so by the knowledge of the truth, which enable us to discern this is truth, this is a lie, what they're teaching is not scriptural. And so he then warns against another gospel. There is only one true gospel, and all the others are false. We do not add to the gospel. There's nothing that we have to do to improve the gospel. There's nothing that we can do to improve the gospel. It is the old tried and true message of grace, uh, salvation by uh, faith alone. And so in Galatians 1.8, Paul says, Even if uh, we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He's saying there that no matter if it's we who come and preach a different gospel or an angel from heaven who appears to be an angel from heaven comes and preaches to you a different gospel, don't believe it. You have to stick to the gospel that was taught and pre preached to you originally, the one by which you were saved. And so these false apostles, they came in, an, uh, in the name of another Jesus with another spirit bearing a different gospel. And what did the Corinthians do? They put up with it readily enough. They showed no discernment. They showed no doubt. They just took it as truth because these false apostles deceived them so easily. And this is what worried the Apostle Paul, their loyalty. Their loyalty was just gone out the window so easily. It didn't, uh, by the wording here, it just appears they, they just accepted it. They didn't even question it. Um, there was no uh, loyalty to reason, to truth, to really examining what they were saying. And so 
Paul, again, uh, desired the Corinthians to have loyalty to God. His desire was for them to love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he had that, the same desire that we see expressed in Hosea 6.6, 6, where it says, For I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. Um, whatever these false apostles were, more than likely they were some form of Judaizers, Judaizers who would come professing some form of works-based salvation. And, and Paul's desire was, why, why are you going to accept that with the free offer of the gospel? Paul was shocked that after, after spending almost two years with them, teaching and preaching, that they would just so easily be led astray. And so he, he hits uh, verse 5 um, with his last and final point, which is, Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Again, that word in, indeed in the Greek is, is gar, is for. This is his fourth bullet point. Um, and that is that he desires the Corinthians to have loyalty to the truth. Um, he's saying you can so easily be seduced by these false apostles, apostles because they're, they're skilled speakers. They're skilled orators. Uh, if you look at the way he says this, it's really humble. Um, he, again, he, we just spoke about how Paul just hates speaking highly of himself. He doesn't say, I consider that these super apostles are not near as superior as I am. Or he doesn't say that I am far superior to these super apostles. What he says is that I don't think that I'm at all inferior to them. He just baseline, I think that I'm just as good as they are. Um, the Greek wording here literally states that I consider myself not in the least inferior to these extra super apostles. There's a little bit of sarcasm in it. Um, and Paul's known for sarcasm. If you look down at verses 16 to 23, he really gets into some sarcasm. He says, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. While I, what I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear with it some when it you, for you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts air on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we are too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Paul admits that maybe he hasn't said enough, maybe he hasn't defended himself enough, and he knows that saying all this makes him sound like a fool, makes him sound like a madman. And he says, you, wanted to, uh, you want to compare my apostleship to theirs? Well, here's my list of qualifications. I, I had beatings, imprisonments, and often was near death. If uh, you remember back to Acts 9, when Ananias was sent to Paul to open his eyes, uh, Christ said, For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. It's those hardships and trials that show who is the true follower of Christ, right? We, we take away the fame, take away any benefits of being a Christian, and you'll soon discover who is the true believer. Um, we have seen this as of late, as so many churches have folded to governments because they, do, they fear some kind of punishment or persecution is going to come. And it does appear that as a nation, maybe now we're entering a time of change where there will actually be a cost for professing the name of Christ. But if those times do come, we can take heart and remember what Paul boasted in. He boasted in his beatings, in his persecution. He boasted in being almost killed for the name of Christ because he said, in my weakness, he is made perfect. That's the good news for us is no matter what happens to us, Christ is going to grow in our hearts and we one day will be able to be with him. And so wrapping up verse 6, Paul says, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Now that word uh, unskilled there is idiotus, which is where we get that word idiot from. It sounds a lot like our word idiot. It's unskilled. Uh, it has this contemptuous edge. He, he's saying, I know I'm not skilled as an orator. He doesn't try to 
pretend that he's a better speaker than he is. He knows he's not as skilled as these false apostles are. Um, Rhetoric was a long-established, highly esteemed profession during the time of the Greco-Roman Empire. And Paul saying, my oratory skills may not measure up to them. That was not something he tried to hide, and it wasn't something he probably tried to do better at. Um, Apparently, though, these orators were a concern for Paul, not only in Corinth, but in the other churches as well. In Romans uh, 16, verses 17 and 18, he uh, warns the church in Rome, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Um, Though today we we don't hold to oratory skills in such a high regard as the the, uh, Greco-Roman Empire did, we, we still enjoy someone that's easy to listen to, somebody that's theatrical in their presentation. But there's a danger in this, right? What, what matters most in preaching is not the preacher, but it's the message that he is preaching. The truth concerned Paul far more than the presentation, and that's how it should be for us. We should want the truth more than somebody who's easy to listen to, easy to watch. Um, theatrics and manipulation, what they do is they draw attention to the speaker rather than to the message. And if, if the ambassador of the message is becoming the focal point, he's failed at delivering the message. The preacher is simply giving the message of Christ. He's pointing people away from himself and to Christ. And so Paul says, that's fine. They can be good speakers. It doesn't bother me. Um, and so his, his, his knowledge, though, is something that he will not concede to. He will not say they have more knowledge than I. And by knowledge here, he, he means his understanding of Christ and the gospel. Um, Paul would not submit to them saying we're more knowledgeable than Paul because he knew that this was false, this was a lie. Um, He's not only referring here to his Old Testament knowledge because we knew that he was a Pharisee, that he was very well taught in the Old Testament scriptures. He's referring to the knowledge of Christ revealed to him on Damascus Road and revealed to him directly by the Spirit being an apostle. Um, So that's not Paul boasting in himself, saying, I'm so knowledgeable, I've learned so much. He's boasting in Christ there. Um, As he says in 1 Corinthians 2.2, when he was with the Corinthians, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul would desire to forget all of his Old Testament teaching, all the things that he learned as a Pharisee from Gamaliel, simply to know that Christ came and him crucified. Uh, So just in a recap this morning, we we talked about the four bullet points, the four loyalties that Paul Paul is concerned with, loyalty to God, loyalty to Christ, loyalty to the gospel, and loyalty to truth. Um, We always got to ensure, first and foremost, that our hearts are being loyal to God, that our devotion is purely to God, and we do that by making sure we're in the word, making sure we're in prayer, making sure we're fellowshipping with the saints, and then Likewise, let us look out for one another. We, we have a church here who uh, really does study in God's word and can look and see things that maybe we can't. So let's be open to correction by brothers and sisters. Amen. Okay. Anybody have anything to add? All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Father, for your word and for your teaching. Help us to always remain loyalty to you and to your one true gospel message. We pray that this morning um, you would allow us to worship you uh, freely and truthfully and just uh, be with Jason as he delivers the message this morning. Open our, our hearts and ears to hear it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.